As, as all of you know, this week there's been uh, just a, a huge and, and, and terrible uh, hurricane, Her- Hurricane Matthew, that has uh, uh, come up uh, through the Caribbean and up along the uh, east, southeastern coast of the United States. You've all been reading about it and watching it and seeing what's going on. Uh, the Wesleyan Church has uh, quite a bit of ministry in Haiti. Uh, there's a hospital there in La Genave, and uh, we, we have a number of Haitian people that live right here in our district, primarily in New York City and in Philadelphia, and they're part of, of uh, the Wesleyan Church, and um, just a, a very poor uh, people there in, in Haiti and very fragile. Uh, many of the people who faced this storm were still living in Tet tent-like structures that were provided for them after the earthquake. And if you can imagine being in a tent and uh, over 100 mile an hour winds and 25 inches of rain, over 300 people died right there in Haiti. And so uh, the Wesleyan Church has set up a a special fund, the Wesleyan Emergency Relief Fund, and uh, we would like to give you the opportunity to give through your own local church. I know that we all get many different requests from uh, various other organizations, and that's wonderful. They're they're good organizations. They do good things. But uh, we want to give you an opportunity right here through our own church to be able to give. And uh, we we know the people, uh, the the missionaries from uh, the Wesleyan Church come right here and and, and minister to us in, in our own church. The the uh, administrative costs are always kept very low, and so uh, nearly every dollar that you give goes into the work. And so if you would like to uh, make a contribution, uh, you can uh, do it in um, a couple different ways. One is that right here this evening, uh, when you place your tithes and offerings in the offering box, you can write a check and designate a portion of that that you add to your giving. Uh, you can designate it right on your check. If you want to use offering envelopes, many of you have personal envelopes. Uh, there's also envelopes uh, in the back of the chair, and you can mark your, your offering for the uh, relief effort, and that's what, you, that's what you would put on, Haiti Relief, Haiti Relief, and that money will go into the Wesleyan Fund. If you are not prepared to do that tonight, you can do it online at our website, uh, ca- uh, calvarywesleyan.org, um, or calvarywesleyanchurch.org, C- calvarywesleyanchurch.org, and uh, you can go online giving, and if you don't have an account, it's very easy to set up, and you can give it that way. Or you can also go to wesleyan.org and give directly. That way it, it doesn't come through our church at all. It goes directly to the Wesleyan church and can uh, be even a little quicker in getting uh, to the people of Haiti. And they have a set up there where you can give online as well. So you have several different options if you would like to do that. And I know when we see people hurting like this, and especially people that are in such poverty, we want to reach out and help. And so if you would like to do that through, uh, through this local church or through the Wesleyan Church, we just wanted to let you know a little bit about how, how you could do that. We all need uh, help, and uh, we all need the Lord as we just sang. How, how many of you have ever been through conflict? You ever? Yeah. We, we won't ask if you're in conflict right now, but uh, you know, we, we all have uh, conflict um, perhaps in our family, perhaps at work, uh, perhaps uh, in discussions with people about religion and politics. Well, this is really a, a, a wonderful time to, uh, to be talking about uh, conflict. I, th- I think God kind of has a sense of humor. I plan at least the skeleton of, uh, of the sermons that I'm going to do uh, about six months in advance. Matter of fact, this Monday I just went... Uh, to plan January to July. And so six or so months ago, uh, we, I planned uh, what we were going to be sharing, and, and Roger and I uh, decided on the time that we would, um, would do uh, fault lines. And I think God just has a wonderful sense of humor that, uh, that he would choose that I would be speaking on conflict on the same weekend as the second presidential debate. I think that kind of uh, fits in there really, really well. But, um, you know, friction is something that's required for us to make, process, uh, to make progress, but it also causes um, 
heat. And uh, the story of Joseph is full of conflict. And uh, I've got to get this straightened up here so I can see it. But um, it, it's full of conflict. Um, Howard Hendricks, who is a retired professor at uh, D- Dallas Theological Seminary, he has written and spoken uh, about couples. And he says, if you and your spouse always agree, one of you is unnecessary. And so, uh, you know, conflict and disagreement is something that uh, is part of our lives. And we want to talk about it tonight, how to handle conflict. And our sermon series is uh, Fault Lines. Well, we want to look, first of all, at the roots of conflict. Uh, and, And there was conflict in the life of Joseph. Joseph is the story that we're looking at tonight. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 37, 39, and 40. And this is the, the story of, of Joseph. And I'm not going to read all the scriptures to you tonight. Uh, many of you are familiar perhaps with the story of Joseph. Maybe uh, you haven't. But whether you've heard the story of Joseph before or not, I'd encourage you to read this and, and look at it from this standpoint of conflict. And there's three different sources of conflict that uh, were part of Joseph's life. The first one was jealousy. Jealousy uh, from Genesis uh, 37 verses 1 through 4. And again, I'm not going to read all of these scriptures, but uh, Jacob was was the father and he had 12 sons. And uh, he didn't hide his, uh, uh, his, his favoritism to his son Joseph. Joseph was uh, a son that came along later in life and uh, if you read the, the, the greater context of the story, you'll find that, that uh, Jacob had two wives. He, he, the, the woman that he loved and, and that he wanted to have, he worked seven years uh, to, for her father to be able to have her as his wife. But uh, when it was time for them actually to be married, her father said, no, no, we give the, first, we give the oldest girl first. And so he was married to uh, Leah, and then uh, seven more years of work uh, to to marry Rachel, and and Rachel uh, was the mother of Joseph. So there was a lot of circumstances there in the story that Jacob uh, had favoritism for for Joseph, and uh, to show his favoritism, so no one had any doubt about it. Uh, Here's uh, a man that has 12 sons, and he gives one of them a very ornamentally decorated uh, robe. It was richly ornamented, and uh, he wanted to convey to everybody, this is my special son, this is my favorite child. And consequently, Joseph's brothers were jealous, and they hated Joseph. But Joseph didn't help himself any. He told them about some dreams that he had. And, and basically the dreams were that someday that their mother and father were going to bow down before Joseph. And uh, if that wasn't bad enough, another dream that he had was uh, that the brothers were all going to bow down and worship him. So here's uh, one of the youngest of the brothers saying, hey guys, guess what? And he's standing there with his special coat on, and he says, guess what? I just had a dream. Mom and dad are going to bow down to me someday. Oh, and you guys are too. Uh, Can you imagine why they hated him? So he didn't help himself very much. But uh, conflict among siblings can be very intense. And in the story of Joseph, we'll see that. And and, uh, parents, we we need to guard against favoritism to one son or or daughter uh, at the risk of stirring up jealousy among the siblings. It's it's bad enough to have favoritism uh, for one of your children, but it's even worse when you go out of your way to show that favoritism. Uh, because of how it makes the other children feel. And so uh, as much as possible, don't even have a favorite, but if you do, keep it way down in your heart and don't uh, say it to everybody else. And then uh, another uh, way that this conflict came into the life of Joseph was injustice. Injustice. The, the The first thing was, you know, the father sent uh, Joseph out to check on the other brothers. The other brothers actually had to work 
But Joseph didn't. He stayed back with dad. And one day dad said, well, why don't you go out and check on your brothers? And so he sent him out and, and he went out to check on them. And when he finally found them, they, they saw him coming and they said, oh, here comes our brother Joseph. Why don't we kill him? We'll, we'll kill him and we'll take his coat from him and we'll throw him in a pit. And uh, then we'll, we'll go and tell dad that uh, a wild animal uh, attacked him. Uh, but as they were coming, one of the brothers tried to convince them not to kill him, just throw him in the cistern alive. It was, it was a dry well and there was no water there. And uh, while they were eating, Joseph was in the pit. Uh, they noticed that some slave traders were coming by. And one of the brothers said, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we sell him into slavery? You know, if we kill him, we don't get any benefit from it. We might as well get some money out of this. So they brought him up out of the pit and they sold him into slavery. The, the injustice that uh, was done uh, to, to him. And, and Joseph had not done nothing to deserve this kind of treatment. Now, yes, he may have been foolish in sharing his dreams, but he really didn't do anything to make him hate him so bad and, and to, to do this. And he had gone from the status of a favorite son to a slave. Imagine what that would be like uh, for, for Joseph. And then also there was a, another injustice that when the slave traders... Uh, got Joseph, they took him and sold him to a high-ranking leader of Egypt whose name was Potiphar. And uh, he, uh, Joseph, uh, worked for him, really did a, a great job for him and, and did all that he, that he could uh, to, to honor uh, his master. But one day, uh, Potiphar's wife was looking at Joseph and thought, oh, what a handsome man he is, and look how strong he is, and, and tried to tempt him in, into doing what was evil. And uh, Joseph resisted, even to the point of pulling himself out of, that, out of the coat that he had and, uh, and, and fled the room. Well, then when Potiphar came home, his wife said, look, your servant Joseph was here, and he tried to take advantage of me. And, uh, and uh, right here's the evidence. See, he even left his coat behind. And uh, Potiphar became very angry and threw uh, Joseph into prison. So he went from being the favorite son to being sold into slavery to being thrown into prison. How could such treatment come to the man that God had chosen to be a ruler? And ha have you suffered unjustly? Um, how have you wondered, or have you wondered, why God would allow this injustice? You might have questioned the validity. Uh, of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. How, how can you be in this kind of conflict where, where your brothers hate you, they sell you into slavery, you, you work your heart out and, and are loyal to the master, and then he it throws you in prison because his wife falsely accused you. How can that be working out for anyone's good. But God had not concluded yet with Joseph's life, and he hasn't, included, or hasn't concluded with your life either. And so if you're in that turmoil of, of conflict, don't give up because there's hope. And then the third area of, of uh, injustice is insensitivity. And this is in Genesis 40. Uh, the, the brothers in this whole process showed total disregard for Joseph's feelings and well-being. They were insensitive to him. And all they cared about was how they could get rid of Joseph. They had just become so overwhelmed with this hatred toward Joseph. But also, while Joseph was in prison, uh, there were two men who were formerly attendants to the pharaoh of Egypt and uh, the scripture doesn't tell us what went wrong, but the Pharaoh just got very angry at them and threw them into prison. Uh, it was the, the baker and the cupbearer. And uh, the, the baker is the person who prepares the food for the king, and the cupbearer is the person who serves it to the king. And so I'd say somebody burned the dinner or somebody, you know, they brought him something that he didn't like, but whatever it was, they, they were thrown in prison. And while they were in prison, these two men had dreams. 
and they couldn't figure out what the dreams meant. And so they were telling the, the dreams to others there in the prison. And Joseph said, well, uh, I can tell you what that means. And so Joseph explained that the baker was, in three days, was going to uh, be executed and that the cupbearer was going to be restored to his position with, with favor with the Pharaoh. And uh, he said to the cupbearer, he said, when you're restored and you're in the Pharaoh's pres presence, remember me. Tell the Pharaoh about me. I'm down here in prison and I'm innocent. Be sure to tell him. Well, three days later, the baker was executed and the cupbearer was restored to his position with the king, but he forgot Joseph. And for two whole years, Joseph continued to be in prison and uh, did not, was not remembered by the cupbearer. And then after two years, the Pharaoh had some dreams that he couldn't understand. And he had all of the wise men of the kingdom and all the people that did their magic and everything, and nobody could tell the Pharaoh what his dream was about. And then after two years, the cupbearer said, oh yeah, I remember there's a guy back in prison that interpreted a dream for me. And so he told Pharaoh, he said, there's a man who interprets dreams back in prison. And so finally... Uh, can you imagine how lonely, how discouraging that would be? Two whole years. And finally, the cupbearer said, yes, there's a man named Joseph down there. Uh, does it seem like uh, your boss or maybe a family member is insensitive to you? You've been kind and loyal, but you and your kindness have been forgotten. Take heart. God has not forgotten you. And then we see the resolution of the conflict. First was the roots of the conflict, now the resolution of the conflict. The first is forbearance. Joseph endured prison for two full years before the cupbearer recommended him to Pharaoh and Pharaoh freed him from prison. But, but Joseph was such a model prisoner that he actually was put in charge of all the other prisoners. He, he didn't sit back and feel sorry for himself. He didn't become critical and bitter. Uh, he did uh, the, the, whatever he was asked to do to the best of his ability, and God was with him, and God blessed him, and he was elevated in, in the prison in spite of the way others treated him. A conflict may continue for a long time, but it will end. Uh, there is a, an end uh, to your conflict. But in the meantime, we ought to be patient and stay focused on the Lord. Uh, we are to show the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5.22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The, the idea of forbearance is, is patience. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 3, we are told to keep our eyes on Jesus. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Whatever conflict, Maybe coming our way. We need to remember Jesus went through conflict. He, he went through sorrow. He went through difficulty. And, and we are to keep our focus on him and consider him who endured such opposition. And in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Someone has said that God doesn't pay at the end of every day. But in the end, God pays. And if we suffer for Him, if we continue in forbearance for Him, the payday comes. And the payday came for Joseph when he was elevated 
to be the second in the kingdom of uh, Egypt under the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh trusted him with everything that he had. And then in James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. When, when, when we are suffering, when we are going through these kinds of conflicts, and when, when it seems more than we can bear, we're in good company. Uh, James reminded us that that's what the prophets of the Old Testament bore. That's what Jesus himself bore. That's what the early church bore. Uh, and, and we need to have that kind of forbearance in keeping our eyes on Jesus. But not only patiently forbearing, but also to have forgiveness. Have you asked how you can possibly forgive the person who has brought so much conflict in your life? Or maybe it's not just a person, it may be a, ver- a variety of people who have brought much conflict into your life. Consider Joseph's example of forgiveness. Eventually, as I just mentioned, Joseph was exalted to second in command over all of Egypt, and eventually his brothers stood before him. You see, the dream that Pharaoh had was interpreted by Joseph that there would be seven bountiful years of harvest followed by seven years of extreme drought. And he suggested that the... um, the people and the king would reserve from the abundance for the times of the lean years of the drought. And the Pharaoh said, wow, I need a wise man in charge of such an operation. And since Joseph has been able to interpret my dream, I'll put him in charge of that. Well, this famine struck Israel where Jacob and the the sons were, and uh, they needed food. And they heard that there was food in Egypt. And so they came to get food And it was their brother Joseph who was the one who was in charge of all the fear, of all the food. And and they feared Joseph. They they feared that he would retaliate. Now it was the other way around. Instead of the big brothers out that, you know, they they were uh, workers out in the field, they were probably pretty strong. And Joseph was kind of tender. He was the tenderfoot among them. You know, he never had to work. He was dad's favorite, and so he probably didn't have the strength of, of, of what the other brothers had. And they were afraid that he was going to retaliate, but their fears very quickly, quickly uh, subsided when Joseph told them that he forgave them. And he told them that God, that although they had in, in, intended it for harm, To him, they wanted to harm him. God intended it for good. In Genesis 50, 20, it says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, we can look at Jesus, and we can see that very easily. He died on the cross for the salvation of our sins. But even for those of us who are living today, when we go through conflict, God can use that conflict and, and, and our example of forbearance and forgiveness uh, to be able to touch other people's lives. Joseph's uh, forgiveness actually prefigures or points forward to the forgiveness that we have received from Jesus Christ. Totally undeserved forgiveness. And it's also a model of the undeserved forgiveness that we are to show others. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We are, we are to remember all that Jesus forgave us. And, and not only our own acts of sin, but even just being part of hum, humanity and, and the sins of humanity. We cannot avoid conflict, but we can choose to do the right thing in the midst of conflict. Instead of reacting to it with anger, resentment, impatience, and doubting, we can respond to it with submission to God's will, peace, patience, faith, and forgiveness. And the choice is ours. We don't always choose the conflict. We don't always choose the circumstances. But we can choose our attitude. 
and the way that we respond. We also have a choice of deciding to follow Jesus. You see, forgiveness begins with Jesus in, in, in what we're, we're sharing here tonight. He has forgiven us, and we are to forgive others in the same way that he has forgiven us. And, and we have a choice. If we don't know Jesus as our personal Savior, we can choose to become a follower of Jesus and, and to receive the forgiveness that he has for us so that we can forgive others as well. I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation. And if, if you've never, had, have never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, if you never repented and turned away from your sins and never made a decision to follow Jesus, I'd like for you to pray this prayer with me. And it's not the prayer, it's not the words, it's your heart, it's your heart attitude. And so I'm not asking you to raise a hand or stand up or come forward. I'm not asking you to say anything out loud. But if you really mean this in your heart, as I pray this prayer, you can pray along with me or you can just say, yes, Lord, that's me. That's what, I mean. that's what I want. And if you sincerely, really, truly want Jesus to forgive your sin and you want to become a follower of Jesus, he will forgive your sin and you can become a follower of Jesus Christ right here this evening. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin and I've committed acts of sin. And I confess to you that I'm a sinner. And I come to you tonight and I turn from my sins. I repent, which means to turn around, to change my mind, to change my direction. I, I turn away from my sin and I turn to you. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to forgive my sins, to be my Savior. And tonight I choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ I choose to begin a journey of following you every day of my life. Help me to learn and grow as a believer, as a disciple of yours, to follow you every day. And I praise you and I thank you for your forgiveness of sin. Help me to offer forgiveness to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.